G'day, Techman Pat here. And in today's episode, we're gonna take a stroll through the jungle that is the state of Victoria's energy grid and environmental policies. The good, the bad, and the gory damn ugly. But I'll be honest with you, this video won't fix the problems. One like one prayer just won't work here. We're not a current affair. It may just make you a bit mad. It may be hopeful as we play uplifting music during the final stretch. What I'm trying to say is that at least it'll make you know a little bit more than before. You see, if this was a current affair episode, we would start with a jovial tune and the one and only voice of Tracy Grimshaw will tell us that... Victoria is at the forefront of the renewable energy revolution, embracing wind and solar power to reshape the energy grid. The state is making the switch from traditional fossil fuels to cleaner, more sustainable alternatives. All of a sudden, a drone shot of Melbourne. Then we zoom into one particular house. An angry music plays. Camera pans to a man in his 50s, arms folded, looking like he's about to tell us why millennials don't want to work anymore. But before that, the camera cuts and he's seen screaming at his neighbors who just installed some solar panels. We ask ourselves, why? But before we find out, they cut to a break and we get ads. Are you feeling stressed? Not getting enough sleep? Feeling overwhelmed by the challenges that life dishes out on a daily basis? Well, fret no more because we have the solution to all. I haven't stopped teabagging. I've been teabagging since 1985. We are very privileged to have Mr. Baggington at the State of the Beanstalk show tonight. Thank you for attending, Mr. Baggington. And in his latest novel, Don't Be a Douchebag, Be a Teabag. Upon return, the not Tracy Grimshaw current affairs reporter looks deep into the lens while walking slowly as not to trip over their Venetian studio rugs and says, the Victoria's state government have implemented ambitious climate policies, setting targets to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and promote energy efficiency. These policies are not only reshaping the state's energy landscape, but also setting neighbors against each other. Renewable energy is to blame. The inspiration for this video came from the latest kerfuffle in the media, blaming renewable energy for Victoria's most recent blackouts while the real culprit got away with the dragon gold. So what happened? Well, one of Victoria's three remaining coal-fired power stations shut down just after 2 p.m. on the 13th of February, causing almost half a million homes to lose power and letting wholesale prices soar to new heights, just like GameStop's short squeeze. Power prices increased to 16,600 per megawatt hour that afternoon, compared to $29.61 in Queensland and $286.97 in New South Wales. All four units of the AGL Lo Yang A power station in the Latrobe Valley went offline. Two transmission towers physically collapsed, preventing them from transmitting electricity through the lines, which caused Lo Yang A to trip a switch. The outage came at the same time as the nearby Lauren power station owned by Energy Australia is operating at half capacity due to repair works. And then in combination with wildfires and high winds, havoc spread across the grid and subsequent storm which knocked out six major transmission lines. So let's turn to our politicians and commentators. What did those bench warmers do? Well, Nationals MP Keith Pitt told Sky News this was a glimpse of the future without coal-fired power, because transmission lines are made of coal, of course. While former radio host Neil Mitchell agreed, telling 2GB's Ben Forham, be afraid, this is the future. And he wasn't referring to climate change. This was during a segment in which Fordham claimed solar and batteries failed when we needed them most. In reality, the outage had nothing to do with the type of electricity generation that has been powering Victorian homes and businesses. I have a stern belief that politicians should wear their sponsors' logos on their shirts, like let's say NASCAR drivers, but do the big oil and coal-sponsored liberals have a point? Is there some truth beyond the ridiculous comments on cheap renewables? Could they be onto something? And that's where our video really starts. Let's dig deeper. Why is Victoria's power grid crumbling? Make sure to like this video if you didn't, and subscribe if you want to see more.
As long as electrical transmission lines are kept clean, they last up to 100 years, at least a lifetime, writes John Kasakian, professor of electrical engineering at MIT. They are designed to hold up in adverse weather conditions. However, the electrical towers and insulating systems are more likely to fail over time than the lines themselves. Steel towers can begin to corrode at 40 years of age. The fallen towers in Victoria were of the same age, and while they were designed to hold up in adverse weather conditions, they were not built to withstand intense storms driven by climate change. Since this blackout, Victoria's energy minister has pushed for a national approach to weatherproofing the electricity grid. However, that is more of a reactive move, a move that is just words right now. So the key word here is maintenance. The age old dilemma of building big things only to let them rot away because we're too lazy and cheap to maintain them. But what is to blame for power companies not actively maintaining and upgrading their transmission and power lines? Are the profit margins getting in the way? So let me set the scene and give you a bit of context why all this is happening. The Bureau of Meteorology and Cicero play an important role in monitoring, analyzing and communicating observed and future changes in the Australian climate. In the seventh biannual State of the Climate Report, I found the following highlights. Australia's climate has warmed by an average of 1.47 degrees Celsius since national records began in 1910. Sea surface temperatures have increased by an average of 1.05 degrees Celsius since 1900s, and this has led to an increase in the frequency of extreme heat events over land and sea. There has been a decline of around 15% in April to October's rainfall in the southwest of Australia since 1970s. Across the same region, May to July, rainfall has seen the largest decrease by around 19% since 1970. There has been an increase in extreme fire weather and longer fire seasons across large parts of the country since the 1950s. Snow depth, snow cover, and the number of snow days have decreased in alpine regions since the 1950s. Oceans around Australia are acidifying and warming by more than one degree Celsius since the 1900s, contributing to longer and more frequent marine heat waves. Cause I don't give a fuck what you say, yeah I'ma do shit my way. So, to combat the warming, the Australian government has been enacting energy policies to reduce the generation of carbon emissions that trap heat in the atmosphere. In context, for every tonne of coal burnt, approximately 2.5 tonnes of CO2 are produced. Amongst the six different types of fossil fuels, coal produces the most carbon dioxide. But is coal to blame? We cut down trees for more housing, trees give shade, keeps the sun at bay, but instead it's a frying pan of cars, metals, bricks and pavement. Many of these policies give support to energy industries that generate less carbon emissions. These sectors have grown quickly and have significantly reduced dependencies on fossil fuels. So the government has been pushing the renewable energy agenda. Let's get rid of dirty power. In less than 10 years, Australia has gone from generating 81% of the nation's energy via coal to 58% last year. Solar went from zero to 14.4%, wind from two to 12, gas from 10 to six, and hydro from six to eight. Now, the next 10 years will see numbers change again, but we'll still have one large problem, and that is the infrastructure. And today it is 40 years old and not ready for where our climate is heading. So to Fordham's point, ignoring the obvious issue with this question, where were the renewables when we needed them most? To that we look at centralized battery storage. There are five battery installations commissioned around the east coast of Australia. The five are large but in singular locations. Battery installations solve the problem of no energy at night, or no wind, but again, the cables going to your home are still at risk. No matter how good the system is, if we can't deliver power to each home, we're doomed no matter what. Now, to counter Fordham's point, most of these installations are geared to commence building next year. So we can't even blame them for not being there for us when we needed the most. Some construction has started and will soon allow for load shedding and will help with events like this. And there are already some existing battery installations. But as long as the transmission towers and lines connected to each facility withstand the weather, then we're okay. So what has been done about Victoria's energy grid? Well, like with any other project, resources are necessary. But to complicate matters further, cross-industry alignment needs to happen with projects of this caliber. 
Last year, Victoria's Minister of Energy and Resources, the Honourable Lily Ambrosio, MP, has launched the Siemens Swinburne Energy Transition Hub. The $5.2 million investment will feature a future energy grid laboratory with some of the most advanced digital technology from Siemens to address the challenges within Australia's renewable energy transition. But with a focus on research, development, industry collaboration, the hub is designing reliable solutions, creating opportunities and facilitating groundbreaking activities that leverage Siemens and Swinburne's extensive experience and expertise in digital energy technology to make a huge impact. But what is this hub actually going to do? Well, it's supposed to drive environmental and social impacts through sustainable energy solutions. What kind of solutions? Contribute to Australia's carbon reduction targets and global energy transition efforts. How? Empower future generations with knowledge and skills in cutting energy technologies with what? And foster economic growth and innovation by prompting industry academia collaboration. So more meetings? But one thing, and I hope it's not going to be last on this list accelerate the transition towards next generation electricity grid systems. Let's hope the hub gets us 5.2 million silver bullets to these issues. Here's the dilemma we have. Renewable energy generating systems are replacing old fossil fuel facilities. Instead of paying a high cost to keep something old running, you build a new piece of technology in its place or next to it at a lower cost. But the same old problems still exist whether it's nuclear or coal or renewables. Okay, Pat, throw me a bone. What can we do? Okay, I'll, I'll give you an idea. Just remember you asked for this and let's start with the rant. We could try decentralized energy, maybe take the power away from big corporate greedy shareholder loving profiteers. Decentralized energy is electricity that is generated not on the main grid, but produced nearby to where it will be utilized instead of at a large plant elsewhere and sent through the national grid. Why bother fixing these old lines when you could potentially bypass them? Think of multiple nodes on a network that all connect to each other. And if one wire goes down, there is always a way to go around. You see, the biggest disruptor to electricity generation has been the ever expanding world of independent renewable energy generation. This has allowed electricity generation in areas that were never previously able to do so. In fact, it has been estimated that about 13% of our electrical usage in Australia is generated by decentralized renewable energy sources. And technically, every roof is its own power source during the day, of course. So decentralized power has a few benefits. It's resilient power source, it's kinder on the environment, that doesn't really matter at this stage, cheaper power with more competition, it's more effective, there's less loss of power through transmission. You see, the average loss of power between the power plant and the consumer ranges between 8 to 15%. It's also more reliable as there are less moving parts and smaller groups in control, more effective as it uses less resources and the infrastructure costs are lower. But instead, our government is building renewable energy sources in the place of the old, meaning we still fall into the same traps as before. Like hydrogen and electric cars, the benefit of electric cars is charging at home. I don't want to go to a specialized hydrogen station to fill up. That's old world. Why would we use electricity to then create hydrogen fuel, to then distribute it in high pressure containers, to then fill up a car, and then use that energy to run the car, when I could use the same energy from my home to just run an electric vehicle. Furthermore, an EV can convert 80% of the electricity in the battery into energy, while hydrogen cars currently convert a maximum of about 40% as of today, and both will increase in performance over time. We know that the energy grid is not ready for the weather to change no matter how the energy is being generated. But it is also not ready for the level of strain it will be put under when electric vehicles are the mainstream. What do you think will happen to our grid when we have millions of vehicles all at once siphoning power at dinner time? Don't forget about road infrastructure. Multi-story car parks, for example, have not been built to withstand the sheer physical weight of having electrical vehicles taking up the car park spaces. Electric vehicles can be anywhere from hundreds to thousands of kilograms heavier than similarly sized petrol vehicles because EV batteries are so much heavier than engines. So what does the government do? The government pushes emission targets while the infrastructure falls apart. But why? Well, it all began in Victoria. Recently, the Victorian state government brought back the State Electricity Commission. 
Now, Marty, to understand this 40 chess move, we have to go back to the future. Uh, I mean, the past. Back to the past. Privatization, a catalyst for today's problems and how labor and the liberals screwed us over. The process of electricity privatization in Australia began with a labor government in Victoria in 1992. The government of Joan Kerner sold 51% of the Luoyang B power station. Her liberal successor, Jeff Kennett, then sold the remainder of Low Lang B, as well as the rest of the state's publicly owned generation, transmission and distribution assets, leaving the assets to rot as long as they work for profit. Now, Labor returned to power from 1999, but until recently had made no attempt to reverse these policies. Rather, it has undertaken some dubious privatization of its own, notably the Andrews government's 2018 sale of the land titles and registry office. Then with a 180 backflip, we hear Andrews saying it was wrong, it was a mistake to sell our energy companies. But notably, not the land titles and registry office. I'm sure those chickens will come to roost soon, whatever the cows are. This comes off the back of a broader shift in Labour's positioning, beginning with Queensland after the defeat of Anne Blight's Labour government in 2012. The Blight government had sold a range of public assets, but to Queensland's luck, Bly retained the power distribution transmission networks and coal-fired power generators. Labour then made a significant change to their position. They concluded privatisation was an electoral and economic poison. This significant shift may have put Labour on the path to a national win the following decade. You see, voters and Labour realised privatisation led to the new owners of assets increasing prices of services then cutting costs such as network and infrastructure maintenance to increase their profits for shareholders. Squeeze out every little bit. And in Queensland, Labour returned to power in 2015 after the Liberal government of Campbell Newman, having sought to push privatisation further, was ousted after one term. A bit of proof that we the people have some power maybe? Then, under Anastasias Palustruk, the Queensland government is now investing in new renewable generation through the publicly owned Cleanco including 18 wind turbines as part of the McIntyre Wind Precinct, the largest wind farm project in the Southern Hemisphere. Now, this would ultimately reduce the cost of power in that state. And recent CSIRO reports showed that the mix of wind and solar power in 2023 would generate electricity from $90 to $134 per megawatt hour. The cost range is projected to fall to a 70 to 100 by 2030, with renewables generating 90% of the grid's electricity. CSIRO found coal generation is more expensive, even without the cost of transmission lines to link the power stations to the grid. Coal electricity generation costs between 110 and 220 per megawatt hour in 2023. Now, back to privatization. I haven't forgotten about New South Wales. New South Wales Labour went through similar privatisation rorts, with a series of premiers and treasurers trying and failing to find a way of selling the electricity industry. The disastrous defeat of the Keenly Labour government in 2011 was driven by this failure, along with strings of scandals that seem to be the rule rather than the exception in New South Wales politics. <laughs> So, after nearly 30 years of Labour and Liberals going back and forth, the Labour government learnt a lesson and after affirming to no more privatisation of our state's assets, the Albanese government made the biggest single commitment with a $20 billion rewiring the nation initiative to upgrade the transmission network needed to distribute the soon to be clean energy. The first two projects to be financed are the Marinus link between Tasmania and Victoria and the Kerrang link between Victoria and New South Wales, which will be publicly owned, unlike toll roads in between. Oh yeah, <laughs> I'm going to go there. How do we ever let the government make roads for profit? What is Labour and Liberals' obsession with making public roads private? According to Professor Mark Hickman, the Chair of Transport at the University of Queensland School of Civil Engineering, toll roads in Australia have not reached expected traffic volumes and do not always relieve congestion in the short term. And Melbourne Citylink Tollway M1 and M2 sections carry the highest volume of traffic and also generate the highest revenue of all tollways by a substantial amount. 
but this is due to mainly being an accessory cross road for cross city and North Melbourne airport bound corridors. Basically a toll on poor people who live and work on either side of the town, but I digress. The State Electricity Commission of Victoria is a government owned renewable electricity investment enterprise. The first investment will help build one of the world's biggest battery projects in Victoria, the Melbourne Renewable Energy Hub near Melton. This will store enough energy to power up to 200,000 homes during peak periods. And this is the first investment from the SEC's initials $1 billion towards the 4.5 gigawatts of new renewable energy duration and storage projects. It's really there to help accelerate the energy transition and hopefully drive down the cost of energy. Battery storage solves the night issue with wind and solar generating during the day. Once we figure out what to do with cloudy days, we'll be good to go. Maybe Snowy will finally start pulling its weight. What's important here is the government has taken back the ownership and responsibility of the national electrical grid to the state. This sounds pretty good. Let's cue the uplifting music. No, hang on, not, no, not yet. Not all new policies and initiatives are a slam dunk. What about this one? Let's pay companies who use a lot of power to use less power. By we, I mean the government, and by pay, I mean our tax dollars. Recently, to help secure Victoria's energy system, the Australian government will support the Portland aluminium smelter in using less power. The Alcoa-owned Portland facility is a major user of electricity and representing around 10% of Victoria's electricity demand. Now, to ease pressure on the grid and prevent blackouts, particularly on hot days, Portland is going to be paid to reduce its demand. The Australian government will provide 76.8 million over four years that's already been 2021 to 2022, and then 2024 to 2025 to secure Portland's participation in the Reliability Emergency Reserve trade scheme. And under this scheme, Portland can be paid to reduce its electricity use when the supply demand balance is tight. Why are electricity prices so high? Now, Australia's electricity market is structured with a combination of private and public ownership. The national electricity market operates across the eastern and southern states, fostering <laughs> competition amongst generators and retailers. However, this competitive market structure does not necessarily translate into lower prices. There are inherent risks with privatizations. The most obvious one is profit driving, but one crucial factor contributing to high electricity prices is the aging infrastructure across the country. You see, Australia's energy infrastructure, including power plants, transmission lines, and distribution networks require substantial investment to maintain reliably and meet growing demand. The costs associated with upgrading and maintaining this infrastructure are often passed on to the consumer, leading to higher electricity prices. And Transporting electricity is a cost most people don't consider, but it accounts for a staggering 40% of a typical household's bill. Compared to the cost of the power you actually use, the cost of getting it to your home is approximately double. But access to electricity goes beyond these physical implements and also necessitates a party from which to buy from. This is a service retailer providing a service and has ended up being the driving force of a further 25% of electricity price rises since 2007. The site gratan.edu.au wrote that this was not the outcome expected when retail electricity markets were opened to competition and is the subject of further investigation by the ACCC. Now, Australia's commitment to reducing carbon emission has led to the implementation of various climate and environmental policies. While these policies contribute to the expansion of renewable energy that could drive the prices down, they also impact electricity prices due to the associated costs of compliance and subsidies. Now here's the thing, this isn't a new trend. Privatization took hold in the early 90s. So if we look back at the years 2003 to 2013, the prices for household increased an average of 72% for electricity and 54% for gas. Now, if we break this down by city, the rate of increases for electricity has been 30% in Perth, 41% in Adelaide, 73% in Brisbane, and 107% in Sydney. Now, for those cities connecting to natural gas networks, household gas prices increased over the 10 years to June 2013 have ranged from 40% in Sydney to 78% in Perth. Now, from 2013 to 2023, it hasn't been that bad, but it's 
on their way up still and estimated to rise even further by 2030. So what is the, let's say, ACCC going to do about it? The ACCC latest electricity market inquiry report revealed that residential electricity bills were higher across most national electricity market states in the September quarter last year compared to the equivalent quarter in 2022. Now, the report presents analysis of 13 million residential and small business electrical bills, New South Wales, Victoria, Southeast Queensland, and South Australia between July and September 22. Now, it explains that electricity bills will increase further this year as the record high wholesale prices from mid 2022 continue to flow through to this year and to customers. Now, the ACCC Commissioner Anna Brakey said, wholesale electricity prices have eased since the peak in the middle of 2022, but we expect electricity bills to increase further this year due to the lag in wholesale costs flowing through to consumers. The ACCC is monitoring retail communications and that's what they will do for now. energy, climate change, energy prices, energy policies, fossil fuels. But I think it comes down to these questions. Is the privatization of our energy assets to blame for failing infrastructure and high energy prices? And is the corporate profit chasing to pacify shareholders just the natural order of a private company and what else is expected? As far as I can tell, the public opinion on privatization is for the nays. There was significant public support for privatization in the 80s, but this went into decline after major privatization actually began in the early 1990s. It took decades for the effects to actually come to light and start affecting your wallet. And it's not just energy assets. The failings of formerly public enterprises like Qantas are now regularly traced back to the process of privatization. And I think we can do the same here for Victoria. Now, the economics of selling income generating assets just doesn't stack up anymore. Maybe the government sees that now and hopefully saves the NBN from becoming private. I'm not saying that it will but looking at the track record. I hope the argument that privatization was better for taxpayers by selling state assets and reducing public debt is closed for good. It is short-term gains for long-term losses. And this may have been a response to the times of high interest, but when interest rates on public debt are below the rate of inflation, government-owned assets generate returns well above the cost of the capital invested in them. And the states that kept ownership of their energy assets like Queensland and Tasmania have received steady flow of dividends and the value of their assets have appreciated. So can Victoria unring that bell? Maybe. Renewables will continue to bring down the cost of electricity and circa 2019 was when they became cheaper than fossil fuels. So it's been a pretty short road. I leave you with this. Don't let any government privatize basic services such as education, internet, energy, roads, and water. These should not be subject to market forces and shareholder greed. Friends, thank you very much for watching. I hope this long video was informative. Uh, make sure to like and subscribe and I'll catch you all in another video. Of course, leave your thoughts below. Bye. Do 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 do